So next session is um, by Jacob Bean on Maroon X. Jacob Bean is associate professor at the University of Chicago. And so please go ahead and start your talk. And everyone uh, move to the Jacob's session, please, on Huba app to ask questions. Great, can you hear me? Wonderful. Yes. So I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about Maroon X, which is a new high precision radio velocity instrument that's been commissioned on Gemini North. I'm the Maroon X PI and uh, Maroon X was built and I want to highlight the contributions from our core team. This has really been a labor of love for a, for a small team of people who built and still operate and maintain the instrument uh, here at the University of Chicago. Of course, we're also uh, the beneficiaries of collaboration with a broad number of people, uh, users in the community, and of course, uh, our uh, really important partners, the Gemini Observatory and all the staff there. So Maroon X, as I said, it's a new extreme precision radio velocity instrument that we commissioned uh, as a visiting instrument on Gemini North. Um, Maroon X was designed to do high precision radio velocities, particularly to find rocky planets around uh, late type stars, M dwarfs. Uh, so everything about the instrument in terms of its wavelength coverage, its sensitivity, everything uh, really was driven by this science goal. Uh, so what we came up with was a highly stabilized fiber fed spectrograph uh, covering 500 to 920 nanometers in two arms, operating a re resolution of 85,000. We have simultaneous calibration feed uh, to calibrate and maintain a high precision of radio velocities. We have a simultaneous sky fiber, and we use the technique of pupil slicing uh, to keep the instrument small while maintaining uh, a large acceptance area on the sky uh, and still high spectral resolution. Maroon X was commissioned in 2019. It's been in regular operation since 2020 and it's been offered and is being used by the community. Uh, its performance has been outstanding. And I wanna make a small correction to what uh, Jennifer said at the very beginning of this uh, today's uh, session. It's not achieving one meter per second, it's achieving 20 centimeters per second radio velocity precision. Uh, and it's doing that on uh, fairly faint stars and we can do even high precision radio velocities out to stars in dwarfs as faint as visual magnitudes of 19. And I'll show an example of that. You can see, you can find more information about Maroon X in SPIE papers that were led by Andreas Seifert, who is really the person who built uh, and runs the instrument. So at the last Gemini Science Conference about three years ago, uh, we were getting ready to uh, finish the construction of the instrument and we we're starting to think about shipping the instrument. Uh, we did that less than a year later in late April of 2019. Uh, we had finished the construction and we packed it up and then we sent it to Gemini North uh, and we began the commissioning phase. So Maroon X is different from a lot of the other instruments at Gemini in that it doesn't sit in the instrument support structure on the back of the telescope. Maroon X actually sits in the so-called peer lab about 45 feet below uh, the Gemini North telescope. So here's an image of what the environmental control chamber looks like. Maroon X is contained in a vacuum tank that itself sits in this environmental control chamber that itself sits in the thick concrete pillar uh, that supports the telescope. We bring the light to the instrument using fiber optics. So we have a front end that mounts on the instrument support structure. In this case, we mount uh, in that a structure at the position of NERI and NIFS. Uh, so it's not an instrument that's on the telescope all the time. It comes on and off. The front end unit comes on and off. Uh, so Maroon X was completely disassembled for shipment. Uh, and then we had to reassemble at the telescope. Uh, and so in May and, and summer of 2019, uh, we were engaged in doing that. Uh, and after a few months, we were successful in achieving uh, first light uh, with the instrument in September of 2019. So Maroon X has two arms, as I mentioned, this blue and red arm that we call them that cover 500 to 920 nanometers. And you can see the impact of the pupil slicer here and that uh, for every a shell order, there are three spectra of the star that you're looking at, plus calibration, plus sky. So Maroon X was built for high precision radio velocities. And based on lab testing, we had a good feeling that the instrument would perform a well. Uh, but the real test is on sky, the achievable radio velocity precision on real stars. Um, and so we've been really gratified to see that the instrument's performing uh, really almost better than expected. Uh, here are some observations that we obtained about a year ago. 
These are observations of an early M dwarf known as GJ908. Previous observations with existing instruments had shown that this star was radio velocity stable, let's say the one, one and a half meters per second level. Uh, our observations of this star have a very low scatter. So over two weeks, uh, we're able to achieve precisions down about the 20 centimeter per second level. Uh, the key number here, if you can see my cursor, is the RMS of the uh, epic mean points. These are just single observations of about five minutes each uh, of this fairly bright for us uh, M dwarf. Uh, we combine just the blue and the red arm together with a simple weighted mean uh, and our uh, uncertainties, which are limited by the photon noise, are comparable to the root mean square uh, of these velocities. And so. Uh, these are the best ever radio velocities uh, obtained for an M dwarf. Any uh, previous or currently existing instrument, nothing has achieved this level of precision. Uh, and we were able to do this uh, just a, one year after first light uh, uh, in one of the first couple of science observing runs. So I want to talk and highlight now uh, some of the first scientific results uh, that we're getting from the instrument and the things that we're, that we're doing looking forward. Uh, and I want to talk about this M dwarf known as Gliese 486. Gliese 486 is a fairly was a fairly anonymous M dwarf uh, with a spectral with a mid M spectral type at a distance of about eight parsecs from our solar system. This is a very anonymous star. Most stars in our Milky Way galaxy are like Gliese 486. Now, this star had been the subject of high precision radio velocity measurements for uh, almost 20 years uh, by the time that we uh, started focusing on it. Uh, and you can see the previous measurements with uh, instruments that you may recognize, high resonant Keck and HARPS. Uh, the previous standards uh, for radio velocity measurements showed a large scatter in the data points, and there was no coherent signal uh, in these measurements. And so while the error bars were small, the true scatter was larger, suggesting either stellar activity or perhaps underestimated uncertainties. This target became uh, subject to more intense observations with the Carmenis team uh, in the early to mid 2000s. Uh, and they started seeing evidence uh, for periodic variations in the, in the existence of a planet. But this star became much more interesting uh, when TESS observed it. So TESS is an all sky transiting planet uh, mission launched by NASA a couple of years ago. Uh, and TESS observed this star uh, in sector 23 in March and April of 2020. And from these data, you can see the detrended uh, photometry shown here in the middle panel. We see the regular dips with a period of about 1.5 days, uh, indicative of a uh, small transiting planet. Uh, we began intensive radio velocity observations once TESS alerted us to the detection of this transiting planet candidate uh, at the time. Uh, and during our first science run in May of 2020, uh, we observed this intensively to try to uh, obtain uh, the mass to confirm the existence of this planet and measure its mass. I should highlight that these observations were taken fully remotely from our homes uh, in Chicago due to uh, immediately following the COVID-19 shutdown of Gemini North. We didn't anticipate using Maroon X remotely uh, and especially so soon uh, and during our first science observing run, but uh, the circumstances forced our hand and it turned out that worked really well. Uh, and so every observing run that we've done since then is fully remote uh, and we just do it from our homes or our offices uh, in North America, basically, on the continent. So anyway, we have radio velocity observations of Gliese 46. Because it's a transiting planet, we know the period and phase that we expect. Uh, and all we need to do is determine the amplitude and shape of this curve. Uh, and uh, we obtained really high precision measurements. This is a fairly bright M dwarf uh, for us. Uh, and we easily see the radio velocity signature of this transiting planet. Here's the phase folded radio velocities now for uh, Gliese 486b, this now real planet, where we've measured the velocity semi amplitude to a precision of about 10 centimeters per second, and the resulting mass of the planet to better than 5%. Uh, so this is an extremely high precision mass measurement for this planet. The radius is known to comparable precision from the, uh, from the beautiful test photometry, so we have a precise density measurement from this planet. These radio velocities show a scatter of only about 30 centimeters per second when you've been over 30 minutes and you combine the blue and the red arm data. This far exceeds the precision obtained with previous instruments. I highlight, for example, the RMS of the Carmenis data, which is about two meters per second. 
These data, uh, this, this curve is shown with no detrending to the radio velocity measurements. Stellar activity is a key limiting factor often for radio velocity measurements and decorrelation against photometry and spectroscopic diagnostics of activity are oftentimes used to reduce the RMS and, and detect small planets. Here it wasn't necessary. This is a fairly old M dwarf that's slowly rotating with low activity. And over the span of two weeks, we can easily measure uh, this signal down to a few tens of centimeters per second. So this planet, which we've uh, discovered, is consistent with an Earth-like core mass fraction to high precision. Uh, and this, these results were published in Science earlier this year. Our results for Gliese 486b motivated us to launch, uh, and we have an ongoing survey to, to measure masses of all the test planets orbiting M dwarfs within 30 parsecs. We want to measure masses to a precision of about of better than 10%. Uh, and the goal is to build a statistical sample uh, of planets transiting M dwarfs to understand what the mass function is of these planets and to populate the mass radius relationship and to do that in a robust statistical way. I show here on the, on the left panel the uh, current status of the mass radius relationship from this ongoing program where I've populated uh, the plot with colored points from our ongoing survey. One of these points is Gliese 486b, which we've published. Another is uh, contained, there's two more points from another system called LTT 1445. That's a paper that's been submitted for publication. Uh, and the other points are preliminary results. So we're building up the statistical, statistically robust sample. Uh, and we're, I think we're gonna see some really interesting stuff from this. Now, all of the planets, because they're orbiting nearby M dwarfs and are, and are mostly rocky planets are really exciting targets for JVST and ELT atmospheric characterization. And indeed, uh, both of the planets that we've measured, we've confirmed and measured masses of, that's Gliese 46b and LTT 1445b, uh, are both targets of approved JWST cycle one observations. Uh, Gliese 46b, I'm just showing here our expectations for looking at the secondary eclipse of this planet to diagnose whether the planet has an atmosphere or not. That's the first order question we wanna answer about these rocky planets orbiting M dwarfs. Can they form and retain atmospheres in the face of stellar erosion? And uh, I'm showing here the simulation showing how single broadband secondary eclipse with JWST using just uh, about a dozen hours of JWST time will easily allow us to distinguish between bare rock and atmosphere scenarios. The Maroon X observations are critical, not just for revealing that this is a rocky planet and measuring its properties very precisely, but also for predicting when the secondary eclipse happens. We need to know the eccentricity of the planet's orbit to know when the secondary eclipse happens and to efficiently schedule JWST observations. So all of the other planets that we're following up with Maroon X will be great targets uh, for these kinds and other kinds of further characterization observations. Because our radio velocity precision is so high, we realized that we can pursue additional science beyond just following up transiting planet candidates. And so we've recently launched through a large and long program, a search for planets uh, orbiting the nearest G, K, and M type stars, the stars within four parsecs that are amenable to these kinds of radio velocity only observations to search for new planets. So this is a three year band two IQ85 LLP that started uh, just a couple of weeks ago uh, and uh, we'll be carrying out observations in concert with our approved GTO program as well, looking at fainter stars to build up a sample of the planets uh, showing the detection limits here. We should be able to push into the Howell zone, rocky planets in the Howell zones for all the stars uh, that we're looking at. Maroon X has outstanding sensitivity to planets around even very faint stars. Uh, the stars that we're looking at and these kinds of programs are kind of the bread and butter of previous instruments and we're pushing the precision, but we can also push faint and towards fainter stars. And for example, here are observations of the Ross and McLaughlin effect for planets in the TRAPPIST-1 system, probably the most famous exoplanet system that exists, seven planet system, rocky planets in the habitable zone. We wanna use the Ross and McLaughlin effect to measure the spin orbit alignment for the planets in this system. And we've made observations of transits of two planets, which I'm showing here. The challenge of these observations is that TRAPPIST-1 is very faint. It's a brown dwarf with a visual magnitude of nearly 19. The transits of these planets are about an hour and you need at least four and ideally six or more observations during the transit with meter per second precision to measure this sort of five meter per second roster McLaughlin amplitude. So we've been able to do that and our preliminary results suggest that these planets are aligned in a single plane that's aligned with the equator of the star. These observations also are only based on data from the red arm. An object this faint and red uh, doesn't give any signal to the blue arm. 
We've been able to detect the atmospheres of exoplanets using high resolution cross correlation spectroscopy, very similar to what Greg May showed in Eigren's talk just previously. This is the detection at 10 sigma confidence of the thermal emission from an ultra hot planet known as KELT 9b. We're now performing observations of many other ultra hot planets to detect atomic and molecular species that show up in the Maroon X band pass with science goals of measuring the chemistry, composition, dynamics, and thermal structures of these planets' atmospheres. These data are ideal for the application of new spectral retrieval techniques that allow you to measure the abundances and determine things like the temperature pressure profile in the atmosphere. Our KELT 9b observations uh, give us information on the, uh, the iron and titanium abundances and rule out the presence of molecules in this ultra hot planet atmosphere. Finally, I just wanna summarize uh, and wrap up with uh, uh, look forward, and this is my last slide. Maroon X was commissioned as a visiting instrument and now is deemed a transition instrument by the observatory. That is, the observatory has the goal of adopting it as a facility instrument in the coming years. So we're really excited to do that. For now though, our team is gonna continue to be responsible for obtaining data and taking the observations. Uh, we're also really grateful to uh, the Gemini staff, CE and Teo, who've uh, by their own volition, uh, become trained to use the instrument and will taking observations for us. We'd like to further improve the instrument uh, through the installation of a laser frequency comb, and I'm currently looking for funding to support that project. The instrument demand and output is ramping up. Uh, you can see that uh, we've been doubling uh, the amount of allocated time over the last four semesters. Uh, in the current semester, we have 300 hours allocated, and we're trying to do 55 nights of observations. Uh, papers are slowly ramping up, but I think over the coming year, there'll be a lot more. I'll stop here and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Jacob. So we have a four minutes for the questions and I don't see questions yet, so. All right, <laughs> first question by Jennifer Wirt. In your test follow-up efforts, are there plans uh, to continue observing the host stars once you've obtained a precise mass for the test detected planet in an effort to look for additional planets? Yeah, that's actually one of the key things that we want to do to constrain the mass function of the is, is we're targeting the systems, not just to measure the mass of the known planets, but to find other planets in the system. Uh, that's typically MDORF as planetary systems are often and uh, have lots of planets. And so uh, we think this will be a rich hunting ground and we want to do a complete survey of the inner parts of the planetary systems around these MDORFs to find all the planets. That's a that's a power of radio velocities uh, is that you can do that uh, more easily than with transits. Uh, so yes, we're going to do that. Okay, next question is posted by CE. 20 centimeter per second oh, oh, is really impressive. Just wondering what you think is uh, the limiting factor to go even higher precision. Yeah, um, we're not sure. Uh, there's a lot of factors that enter the noise budget for an instrument like this at the 20 centimeters per second level. And we haven't been able to uh, we have engineering data that I think can help us answer that question, uh, but we haven't been able to look at those. We're mainly concentrated on improving the long-term stability of the instrument. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, instrument hiccups, let's say, over the last set of six months uh, that are tied to uh, issues at the observatory level with like the cooling system and loss of power. There was an earthquake over the summer that uh, was, was damaging for us. And so we're working mainly in terms of uh, improving our resilience to those kinds of interruptions, uh, and then we handle them more gracefully. Uh, and then the purchase and the installation of the laser frequency comb to really uh, improve, to, to take that 20 centimeters per second to make sure we're going to be able to do that for, for a decade. Um, so that's the main thing that we're concentrating on at the moment. Okay, I have a question directly sent it to me. Sent to me. How many other planetary systems are known to be good candidates for JWST uh, transit follow-up? Uh, tens. Uh, so our thirty parsec volume limited test follow-up program has about twenty planets, and all of those would be good targets. Uh, some of those are mini Neptune-sized planets, and so they're much easier. Uh, but the majority, say three-fourths, are rocky planets. And so if you want to build a statistical sample of rocky planets that you want to understand whether they can form and retain atmospheres and, and what the surface mineralogy of those planets are, this is the sample. Planets orbiting M dwarfs, they have a favorable RP over R star, uh, and those are the ideal JWST targets. And so 
like I said, all of the ones that we're looking at will be good targets. Uh, and the two that we've already confirmed and measure the masses of to demonstrate that have already been approved for JWST cycle one observations. Yeah, that sounds great. So there are two other questions on the Huba app. So please go ahead and answer those questions. And we're gonna move on to the next talk.